So a while back, I sent out a survey to everyone on my email list to ask me anything. Fill out this form and literally ask me any question that you want that's related to bassoon playing. Could be a problem you're having, a topic you wanna to learn more about, really anything. I was really surprised at all of the great questions that came in. Um, this gave me a lot of uh, food for thought. And some of the questions I thought were so in depth that I actually already dedicated a few videos to them. Um, so my video about playing high note fingerings, my video about what it's like to be a professional musician, a few others in there were, were from this Ask Me Anything because I felt like that's a really great dedicated video topic. Um, but I wanted to take this opportunity to answer those questions directly, you know, as they come in. And I'll read the questions to you. I'm not going to have a chance to answer all of these questions as much as I'd like to, um, because this video would just be so long <laughs> if I really uh, went in depth. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of pick and choose a little bit of some of the ones that I felt like were really good, common questions that were asked multiple times that I feel like I can, I can explain well in this video. So if your question didn't get answered in this video, I apologize, but I have read your, your response and I might address it in a future video. My name is Dr. Natalie Law and I am a professional bassoonist and teacher and I love to help people just like you learn how to play the bassoon and improve your skills and feel confident playing this instrument. So if that's a topic of interest to you, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and give me a thumbs up if the video is helpful or at least interesting to you. So this question has a lot of different topics in it and some of these I've already covered in previous videos or I, all, I plan to have a video coming out that will address these topics specifically so I'm not gonna dive into all of these. Um, but I'll just pick a few out of here. Um, so this is from Beth. Thank you, Beth. So one of the, the topics was volume and dynamics, particularly in an orchestra. And I think Beth is referring to how when you're playing an orchestra or a band or any type of ensemble, there's always a question of, you know, maybe the music is asking you to play a piano, um, you know, a soft dynamic, but you're playing in a large group and we play bassoon, which tends to be a little bit softer than other instruments. Um, so how do we navigate dynamics and, and being heard, but also playing what's written on the page? Um, and that's another big topic where you just, you have to think about your scenario. So if your music says to play fortissimo, um, but there's you're only playing with a couple other people in a group who are marked at mezzo forte. Obviously the composer wants you to be heard, um, but you also have to be taken into consideration. You don't want to just like blast the other players out so they can't be heard at all. Um, so you, you want to take into context who else is playing. You know, if a really good example of this that comes up a lot, especially in orchestral playing, is if you're asked to play a piano dynamic, maybe you have like a duet with a flute player and you're both playing this sort of duet and you're both marked at piano. So, so the composer wants you both to be of equal dynamic. They want, the composer ultimately wants the flute and the bassoon to be heard equally. If they wanted the flute to be heard more than the bassoon, they'd mark the flute dynamic higher. So think about what the composer is really asking for in that moment. But if they want them equal, the bassoonist is gonna have to tr work a lot harder to be heard than the flute player because of the range of our instrument. Higher notes, higher instruments tend to carry more easily through the ensemble than lower instruments. Bassoon in particular, we struggle with projecting generally through a large ensemble. So what normally might be our piano isn't going to be loud enough in a situation where we have to match a flute player's piano, um, depending on what, <laughs> what range they're in. If they're in their very low register, a flute player, that's often very soft. But if they're in a mid-upper range register, they're going to project a lot more easily. And so we have to match that. So we might need to come up to a mezzo forte, depending on 
what it is that we're playing. So you just have to kind of think, how am I matching the flute player? Do we both have the same thing? What's going on there? Consequently, if you are playing something, whatever dynamic it is, with a lot of other people in the ensemble, probably don't want to stick out. Like maybe something is marked fortissimo for a lot of different people. Maybe you're playing a passage that's fortissimo and you're playing it with the cellos. If the composer is asking for the entire cello section and the entire bassoon section to play something fortissimo, they want, generally, they want cello sound and bassoon sound to come through equally. And they want, you know, they want obviously want it to be a group sound because there's a lot of people playing it. And so you don't necessarily want to stick out. You know, maybe you can play louder than everybody else that's currently playing that fortissimo. You probably don't want to play your loudest fortissimo because it's supposed to be a group fortissimo. You know, you, you don't want any one or two people to stick out. So always think about, you know, what is the end result? What is the composer asking for? A lot of times, th this comes up a lot when I'm uh, in my wind quintet, Pure Winds, in our rehearsals. We will often have conversations around dynamics because it'll be kind of confusing to know what part should be heard. You know, is it should the oboe player be heard? Should the horn player be heard? You know, it, it's not necessarily clear who has, you know, the melody or who has the, you know, the, the most important part. So we start with, well, what does the score say? Does the score have all five instruments on the same exact dynamic level? Then the composer wants us all to be equal. And in a wind quintet setting, where there's flute, oboe, bassoon, clarinet, horn, that's the wind quintet instrumentation, um, for me, if, if, if that composer wants everybody to be a forte dynamic, I know that I have to push a lot harder than maybe my flute player friend because my, my forte to, to match his forte is going to be just, it has to be so much more. I have to push a lot more because it's, it's bassoon and it's a little bit more difficult to hear. And the composer clearly wants us to have like some equalized sound. Consequently, the flute player is going to know that it's going to be hard for me to to project, so they may not play as loud as they possibly can. And a lot of times, uh, it'll happen where if something's unclear, who should be sort of the lead sound in the group, we'll look at the score, and maybe somebody's marked mezzo forte, and everybody else is marked piano. And then it's like, oh, well, the person who's marked mezzo forte really needs to be heard above everybody else, so everybody else needs to come down. So knowing what the composer likely wanted is a good place to start. Knowing who you're playing with, what's the tendencies of their instrument? You know, are you playing with a really loud instrument or a really soft instrument? What what register are they playing in? And how can you match them or not match them depending on what's going on? So that's what I would say about when it comes when it comes to dynamics and volume in orchestras or any type of ensembles, just You've always kind of got to have that awareness of what's going on and what did the composer want in that particular section. Beth asked so many other good questions. Another uh, topic was how to get a bigger and or darker tone. This is a can of worms topic, <laughs> which I'm so glad that everyone is asking me can of worms topics and making me um, answer for these things. But um, how to get, let's start with how to get a bigger sound. Generally equates to louder sound, although bigger might mean you want more of a fuller, more resonant sound. It can be interchangeable. Having a bigger sound generally relates to how you're using your air. So um, a really quick exercise that I tell a lot of students to just blow more air through the instrument and get a, get a bigger sound, bigger, better focused sound, is to put your hand up to your lips and to breathe in in a who shape. So, and if you do that exercise, you'll notice how the air fills up the bottom of your lungs. And that's a deeper breath than what we would use in our normal everyday breathing. Our normal everyday breathing, unless you're exercising, is pretty shallow. So learning how to use the full depth of your lung capacity is key in getting just a better bigger, louder sound in general. It can also have something to do with your reeds. If you're playing on a really sort of soft reed 
or an old reed, you know, that type of reed is not going to allow you to play with a very big full sound. It'll be responsive and, and sort of easy to play, um, but you're maybe not going to get the tone that you want to get. Um, and when it comes to a darker tone, that's a yet another can of worms because when we talk about darker and brighter, um, especially in the double reed world, I think it can mean different things to different people. So, but I think that a lot of it has to do with getting the tone that you want, a beautiful tone that you want, has a lot to do with your air usage and your reeds. Um, certainly there's other things involved with that. You know, you might check that, you know, is your embouchure, you know, pinching on the reed? Is the bassoon that you're playing on, you know, maybe not the best instrument? I mean, there could be other things as well, but I think air and reeds have a lot to do with tone. Another topic from Beth, thank you Beth for, for all the great topics, um, standing versus sitting. What I will say about that is that if you are a beginner, you should be sitting with the bassoon. Like don't worry about standing if you're a beginner or, or early on in your bassoon journey. You wanna use the seat strap because the seat strap supports most of the weight of the bassoon. Um, and then you really only have to balance the bassoon. Whereas when you're standing, whether you have a neck strap or a harness, or whatever that you're using to stand with the bassoon, your body is now holding 100% weight of the bassoon. Now, there's more efficient ways to hold the bassoon than just, you know, with a neck strap or whatever. I've used a number of different harnesses. The one that I use now and actually love is the Jazz Lab harness. And the reason I love it so much is because it changes like the fulcrum of the bassoon a little bit. Um, and it just makes it, it, it the bassoon feels lighter and, and easier to play when I'm using it. And it doesn't feel so like close to my body, which I think is an issue we deal with standing up a lot. Uh, another thing that has really helped my standing is having a balance hanger. Um, and you have to have um, the hole for where the balance hanger sits on your boot joint. You have to have that especially installed if it's not already. It's, it's more something that's on more professional model bassoons. It's not something that would come standard on like a student model bassoon, or you'd have to have it installed yourself to, have, to get a balance hanger. Um, but this sits on the bassoon, and then you can hook into any of these rings, um, and then that changes like the height of where uh, the neck strap is uh, hooking into, and that uh, can make quite a bit of difference. It makes it a lot more comfortable to stand and play bassoon doesn't put as much weight on your left hand. Beth also mentioned choosing an instrument if you can't physically try one out. Um, I wouldn't recommend buying a bassoon without physically trying one out. Um, the only situation I could see that happening is if the person you're communicating with is someone like you either know personally or or there's a trusted bassoonist who knows this person that's selling this bassoon. I know that people find bassoons all the time on, on eBay or, or Facebook Marketplace or wherever and, and just buy it offline online. Sometimes you can hit the jackpot and it's perfectly fine. I've had students who've done this. Um, but in general, you're taking a giant risk because you just don't know, like, when were those pictures taken of the instrument? Are those pictures of the actual instrument? Is it a scam? you know, is this bassoon really gonna work for me? If you're willing to take the risk of buying an instrument without actually trying it, then um, go for it. <laughs> Another question, uh, practice odd fingerings. For example, fingerings above E flat over the staff, D flat, and when to use front or back, G flat and A flat. Do you have any exercises for that? Um, yes, I have a couple videos on sort of alternate fingerings or, or when to use uh, a different fingerings on the bassoon. So I'll throw that up somewhere. I definitely have talked a lot about that G flat or F sharp. Um, and then the, the front and back A flat, uh, I generally would not, if you're talking about the A flat at the bottom of the staff or the top of the staff, I generally would not recommend the one where you're using your thumb unless you truly had no other option. Um, always use the one with your pinky, the front A flat. Some fingering charts have it the other way around. Definitely use the front A flat. Is flicking very important for beginners? It's hard for me to remember when and how to use them. I would not recommend flicking for beginners. However, 
I recommend venting, which is where you're holding down the key that you would normally use to flick uh, for the duration of the note rather than flicking it. So basically how you would view it at is you're just adding an extra key to the fingering and eventually when you become a little bit more advanced, you're going to just go from holding it down to flicking it. That's how I teach my students. I've actually taught students both ways. I've taught students where I do not teach them anything about flicking until they're much more advanced. And then that's the first time they're using their thumb. And I've taught students from the beginning to use their thumb on the venting keys. The students who vent from the very beginning always pick up flicking way more quickly because they're already used to using their left thumb. And so if you're a beginner, um, check out my video on flicking where I, t I also talk about venting. Um, so try to do venting. I know it's hard to remember what keys to press down, but, but try to think of it as I have to add this key to the fingering. Like this is just part of the fingering. Um, just like you would any other difficult fingering, you just try to memorize it. Um, but yeah, vent, I, I recommend venting for beginners and then eventually moving to flicking. Here's a good question that's hard to answer. Um, thank you all for giving me difficult questions to answer. Um, why do bassoonists always sound drastically different from each other? I've rarely seen bassoonists sound the same. That's a very good observation. I think that in bassoon world, it's more common for bassoonists to have quite different senses of tone from each other than other instruments. And um, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, I think reeds is a big, is a big thing. Reed styles are so vastly different from each other. Um, I can tell you in, in all of the teachers that I have had, I've had four or five private teachers that I studied for a, a continuous length of time. Like I didn't just have one lesson, like I studied with them for a period of time. All five of them had vastly different approaches to reed making, which was really frustrating for me as a student because I felt like I was starting over with each one. And I, I've listened back to recordings of myself, you know, from different times where I was studying with a different teacher and playing on different types of reeds and I sound very different. Um, so I think it has a lot to do with reeds. I think bassoon, like brands and models are, are quite different from each other, but I guess I can't really, I can't really compare that, you know, because I'm not a professional saxophonist or a professional clarinetist. Um, so I don't know, you know, like are bassoon brands just like vastly more different from each other than clarinet brands? Um, if you know the answer to that question, I'd love to know, but um, I think it has a lot to do with reeds and with different reeds comes different kind of approaches to playing. You have to do different things in your playing to make your reeds work. When I play on other people's reeds, especially reeds that are made in a different way than I make my own, I sound really different. And I think that bassoon and oboe in particular, I, I heard this analogy at one point that, and, and I think it to be somewhat true that bassoon and oboe or double reeds are the instruments that are kind of closest to the human voice in terms of how they operate. You know, if you think the two, the two reeds on a bassoon or two pieces of cane on a bassoon reed that are vibrating together when you blow through them, that's really similar to how like human vocal folds work. You know, if you think about how a singer um, is producing sound, it's a similar idea. It's just outside of the body instead of inside the body. And I think there's something to be said that, you know, human voices sound very different from each other. Um, and I, I don't know if it's how, with the way that the, the sound is produced, but, um, you know, I think the, the way that sound the, the sound is produced along with all the different types of reed styles um, creates a variety of sounds. Um, so I, I don't have a more specific scientific answer than that. Maybe somebody has a better answer to that question than I do. Um, but that's just been my experience. I, I, I know what you're talking about when bassoonists kind of sound drastically different from each other. But I think there is something to be said, you know, we are bassoonists. Um, other instrumentalists uh, probably hear 
their own instrument being played by different people and think, wow, they have vastly different sounds, you know, to, to us who don't, don't play flute or don't play clarinet, we don't hear quite that difference. You know, we just hone in on bassoon. So it's kind of a little, maybe a little psychological as well. Um, but that's a very good question. Thank you. Here's another one. Hi, Natalie. Whenever I play B3 and C4 with the standard fingerings, these notes sound extremely muffled, even when I adjust my embouchure. I couldn't find any alternative fingering, so I, I myself experimented with alternate fingerings for these two notes, and I'd like to know your opinion. If you're talking about the notes that are at like the top of the bass clef staff, B and, and C, there's no alternate fingerings for those. Um, if you feel like those notes are muffled, um, it probably has something to do with the way that you're voicing them, meaning the, the opening to the back of your throat. Um, so really think about using an O shape and using good air support. Remember, good air support blowing through the note. Um, and also try this on different reeds because it could be a reed thing that's just kind of, it's tanking on those notes and it's not allowing you uh, to play well. You know, if you're playing on a really soft reed, those notes might just be kind of muffled. I would definitely check your air usage and definitely use the standard fingering on those notes because um, there's really, there's no alternate fingerings for those ones. That's that's pretty straightforward standard. Here's the next question. Um, and again, there's so many good questions on here. I can't possibly cover them all. So I'm sorry if yours didn't get answered. I'll try and address these topics at some point. But the next one, Hello, Natalie. I'm an American living in Istanbul. I started playing two years ago this month because of my location. I am limited to instruments. According to my teacher, there are only five bassoonists in a city of 13 plus million. Wow, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> um, therefore, I bought a new Chinese knockoff on eBay. The quality is surprisingly good for a beginner instrument. My teacher, who has a beautiful heckle, is impressed as well. My question is, at what point should I consider upgrading and what price range slash brands would you suggest? Thank you for your time. I enjoy your videos. Um, interesting that you are having a good experience with like a knockoff brand that you found off eBay. That's kind of what I'm talking about with, with getting instruments online is sometimes you hit the jackpot and sometimes you get a pile of junk. Um, and you know, if it's if the instrument is working for you and you're working with a teacher who also thinks it's working for you it's not holding you back from playing certain notes or playing in a way that you want to play that's that's perfectly fine as long as it's working for you that's the most important thing i i wouldn't necessarily go to upgrade instruments just because you think you should, you know, there really needs to be a reason because it's quite an investment uh, to upgrade instruments. So I really wouldn't, uh, unless you feel like, you know, you really just can't achieve the things that you're trying to achieve, that's a sign that you've outgrown your instrument and that's when you really should think about upgrading. But really try to make the best sound you possibly can on your instrument and when you feel like you are more advanced than your instrument, then you might want to look for an instrument that will allow you to do more. For price range for a beginner model, you're looking at least a, a couple thousand dollars. Now, a beginner model probably wouldn't be an upgrade or much of an upgrade from what you have. Um, so the next level up would be kind of like an amateur or intermediate model. Um, and kind of the best amateur intermediate models are the Fox Renard uh, line of instruments. Um, I have a lot of experience playing both a 220 and a 240 model uh, Fox Renard, but I know there's other, now there's 260 and, and other models in the Fox Renard line that I'm, I am not experienced in, so I can't speak for. Um, but I played a Fox 220 for many years um, before I upgraded to my Heckle. I listened back to recordings on of my Fox and it actually sounded quite nice. You know, I, I, I don't feel like it really held me back as much as I thought it did. Um, it really is a good instrument. So if you can get into that line of, of instruments, especially at Fox, which they're super solid instruments, uh, whether you buy used or new, um, that's, I mean, that could last you a lifetime, really. 
Um, and those instruments can range right now anywhere from seven to nine thousand dollars, kind of depending on which model you get and um, if you get any additional things on it and who you buy it from and all that. Here's another good question that I think a lot of people deal with. I realized after a year of relearning the bassoon that my embouchure was all wrong and not addressed by my teacher. How can I unlearn a bad embouchure and learn a correct one? So embouchure is one of those things that can be really frustrating to deal with. And it's also one of the most common issues that I deal with um, with all students. And, and I myself had to do a lot of embouchure work at different points to, to get it to where it needed to be. Um, if you haven't already, I'd recommend you watch my embouchure video um, where I kind of came up with a three step process for approaching embouchure. And if you can remember those three steps, that gets you to kind of like a standard bassoon embouchure. But in terms of relearning embouchure in a good way, obviously you need to know what's wrong about it. So start there with what a good embouchure is like. Um, relearning embouchure takes a lot of mental awareness and a lot of practice. So when now that you know that your embouchure you know, wasn't correct, wasn't working for you. Um, you want to practice playing in the new embouchure, doing a lot of fundamental exercises. My warm up routine uh, is, is where I would be practicing something like that. Scales, arpeggios, long tones, all of that stuff, that fundamental stuff that you're focused on. Um, those are good places to, to relearn and, and build a new embouchure. It can also be helpful to take a little bit of time off bassoon and then come back to it. I have always found that uh, when I've taken a long time off bassoon and then I come back to it, like some things just seem to click a little bit better and it's a little bit easier for me to kind of fix some bad habits because I haven't been actively using them. So that could be helpful as well. Um, but it really just takes mental awareness that every single time that you play, you need to revert to the good embouchure. And and what you'll realize is you'll have that embouchure going for a minute or two and then you get playing and focus on your fingers or whatever and uh, then you revert back to your bad embouchure. And so you just have to keep reminding yourself, yep, gotta fix it. Okay, go back to the, this embouchure. Um, keep reminding yourself. And I mean, it, it probably will take months to be honest with you at least months of constantly reminding yourself to change your embouchure and forcing yourself to get more comfortable with it before it becomes second nature. It's so hard to unlearn a bad habit than it is to just start like from scratch. Um, embouchure is one of those things that I, I feel like every student that I get who I didn't start on bassoon, I'm always talking about embouchure. Always, we're always talking about it. even students. I do start on bassoon. You know, they don't. They develop some you know weird habit, and then I have to kind of undo it. Um, I, I can say from a teacher's side of things that embouchure is just something we're constantly fighting. Um, but just using that three-step process, whistle face embouchure. You know, keep reminding yourself. It just takes time. Here's another question: uh, What's making my bassoon reads crack all the time? Um, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good straightforward question that I'm sure a number of people have dealt with. Um, it could be a number of things. Uh, how are you storing your reads? Are you storing them in a read case of sorts? And of course, remember any type of case that you're storing your reads in needs to have some sort of air ventilation and to prevent mold. Just saying that here because it's a common issue. Um, but you know, are they getting jostled around? You know, when when they're in storage, and maybe that's uh, contributing to a crack. Um, are are you in maybe a drier climate? There's not a whole lot of humidity. It might be helpful to store your reeds in a more humidified reed case, and uh, that will hopefully help prevent cracks because it'll maintain a certain amount of moisture. If if they're cracked, cracking while you're playing, like one moment it's fine, and the next moment it's not while you're playing. Um, maybe it could be that you're not soaking them enough, like they're still pretty dry when you're playing them. Um, or, you know, maybe they get bumped accidentally. Um, or in some cases, you know, there it might just be kind of a weak batch of cane, like 
really soft cane that just cracks easily. Sometimes that is the issue. So it can be a number of things, uh, but really it has to do with moisture. Uh, how are you storing your reeds? Are you soaking the entire reed thread included in the water? Here's a, a fingering specific question. Uh, Hi Natalie, I've always used the thumb F sharp on my student bassoon as a little finger F sharp was hard to reach on my student bassoon. I've recently bought a professional instrument and now try to learn the little finger F sharp because I am playing in the Telon double concerto where you need to shift between F sharp and B flat. I find the low register use of F sharp quite hard sliding from F to F sharp is tricky to get even. I guess it's a matter of little finger strength but also my bassoon doesn't have a roller there. What would you suggest? Um, thanks Marlene for this question. Um, so you want to be able to use both F sharps. The thumb F sharp is what I, and, and this goes for both the low and the middle octaves. I use the thumb F sharp as my go-to and then I only use the pinky F sharp as when I'm, you know, do, using it in combination with the B flat key. So if I, or if I'm using the full E flat fingering where the B flat key is used, I'm using that in combination with the pinky F sharp, but otherwise my go-to is the thumb F sharp. So uh, hopefully that answers your question there. How do I play open F well? It's always either out of tune or airy or weird sounding. Please help. Yes, I'm happy to help you. F is really hard because it's so free blowing because you're not, you don't have any fingers down um, to sort of help control the sound. Make sure, just double check, you know, this may not be the case, but double check that your vocal has been cleaned out. You can use a vocal brush and some soap and like dish soap and hot water and run it through your vocal um, because the, the open F will get kind of wonky if there's, you know, if your vocal hasn't been cleaned out in a while, so that could be it. Could be like a bassoon specific thing, like your bassoon, um, doesn't want to play it. Is if it's like that on all of your reeds, no matter what, you can probably rule out that it's a reed inconsistency. Um, the other thing you can try is you can add the pinky, the upper pinky and the left hand resonance key um, to that F and that should help stabilize it. That's actually kind of my go-to F and I like it because when I use it in combination with G, when I go from F to G, that it, uh, it's less of a change and I don't, I'm not adding the resonance key when I go to G. So you might try that and see if it helps. Um, yeah, otherwise it, it'd probably be a read or, or possibly just kind of an instrument being weird thing. Everything applies the same as to other notes, you know, using good air, make sure you're supporting the note, um, note pinch, make sure you've got a good embouchure going, kind of making sure all those boxes are checked. Hello, I'm a sophomore in high school and I've been playing saxophone since sixth grade, but at the start of my of this year, my band director recommended I learn bassoon. And part of that is that he gave me the disclaimer that he couldn't teach me anything about the instrument. And from what I found, there's no local players that are willing to teach. Um, I know exactly what that's like. That was me growing up. I didn't come from saxophone, but yeah, I, I understand this very, it's very difficult. Uh, so my main struggle is hitting my C and D. I think it's D3 and C3 specifically, but it's the C and D just above the staff. Good, thank you for clarifying. Uh, but even when I try flicking or venting, it feels like the notes just don't come out unless I'm slurring from E or B. So how do I tell if it's me or the reed or the bassoon? Without listening to you, it's hard to tell if it's you or the reed or the bassoon. Um, it's likely that you're pinching on those notes, like maybe you're trying so hard to get those notes to speak that you're just, you're pinching a little bit too much. And if you're pinching so much, you're not allowing the reed to vibrate properly. And therefore it's gonna sound really muffled or it might not work at all. Um, you're, check the tip opening on your reed. If your reed is really closed, um, that would contribute to it. I usually think about a millimeter uh, wide in the center helps, uh, or is the right tip opening that I find for most of my bassoon playing. Um, so check those things. You can rule out if it's a reed thing by trying it on different reeds. So if you're struggling with the exact same thing on multiple different reeds, you can rule out 
if it's a reed thing. It, it could be an instrument thing, but my guess is that since you're just starting on bassoon or recently started on bassoon, that um, it's a combination of air and embouchure and possibly your reed. So thank you so much to those of you who submitted questions. I know I wasn't able to answer all of them. Um, there were lots of really good questions uh, in the survey and I'm really glad that I asked it because it gave me some insight into the problems that you all are struggling with. And um, I wanna do more of this type of thing in the future. So, um, but for the time being, you can ask me questions in the comments uh, and, and I'll do my best to, to answer as I am able to. Um, but if this video was helpful for you, please make sure you're subscribed to the channel, give me a thumbs up um, and let me know in the comments what other questions that you have.